Sit on the end one then. Number six, six again. I'd say so. Okay. Right. <laughs> What you'll typically find when you talk to dowsers is they'll give you lots and lots of anecdotal evidence, lots of stories about how they discovered a leak sure. in their, yeah. their neighbour's pipes and, and so on and so forth. But there are always other possible explanations there. Yes. What we're trying to do is set up conditions which would rule out yes. any of those other yes. explanations. But then we get down to the, the very fundamental basic issue, can the dowsers actually do what they think they can do? Yes. Okay. I think it's full. I think it's four. So shall we see how well you've done? This is this sound. In that case, in that case, I can't do this. This is the waters in number five. Sand again. <laughs> this time, guess was in number three. And this time, water, you're correct. Well that's water. Oh, that's sand. Yes, we've actually got two pieces. Final trial, it's sand again. I'm in that case, I'm 100% wrong again. Uh, well, you got one right on yeah, out of six, which is what we'd expect by chance. So far, they're performing pretty much in line with mean chance expectation, okay. in other words, guesswork. Yeah. So, no one has scored more than yeah. two hits out of yeah. six. Three. Three. The people you've been testing, do they understand why they're being put through the double blind procedure? I think once we've explained it to them, then they appreciate why someone who is perhaps sceptical or doubtful about their claims would see that that was necessary. What's interesting is it doesn't actually tend to dent their confidence at all. Which suggests that they're completely sincere. I, mean, I think they are completely sincere. Yes. And that they're typically very, very surprised yes. when we run them through a series of trials and actually say at the end of the day, well, your performance is no better than would expect just on the basis of, of guesswork. And then what typically happens is they'll make up all kinds of reasons, yeah. some might say excuses, as to why they didn't pass that particular test. I feel the whole test is wrong. I'm shocked beyond words that this has happened. But I did say from the outset, couldn't we just sort out some grey blocks and some scaffold boards yeah. so that I can walk above it, which is what I would routinely do and I've yeah. done for 40 years. Yeah. Who knows where or what bottles were in what tubs. That's the whole point, the isn't it? That's the whole well, yeah, point. But if you understand dozing like I do, you'll understand that everything leaves an image. This state of denial is extraordinary. Even when confronted with hard fact, these dowsers prefer not to face up to truth, but retain their delusion. Rather than adapt to evidence, many of us, it seems, remain trapped in ways of thinking inherited from our primitive ancestors. Irrational belief, from dowsing to psychic clairvoyance, has roots in early mankind's habit of attributing spirit and intention to natural phenomena such as water, the sun, a rock or the sea. The sea has often been thought to be a malevolent force actively out to get you. In 480 BC, King Xerxes of the Persians built a pontoon bridge across the Hellespont and a rough sea came and, and wrecked it. And King Xerxes was so furious that he sentenced the sea to 300 lashes. I wonder whether there's something of King Xerxes in all of us to this day. We don't want to believe that things just happen. We want to believe that there's some kind of deliberate intention behind everything, even where inanimate objects are concerned. And perhaps that is the key to humanity's belief in the supernatural. Even in the 21st century, despite all that science has revealed about the indifferent vastness of the universe, the human mind remains a wanton storyteller, creating intention in the randomness of reality. The delivery of rewards by a one-armed bandit is determined at random, but many gamblers want to think that what they do can increase their chances of winning the jackpot. 
They stand on one leg or wear a lucky shirt. Are these superstitious behaviors a byproduct of our evolution? All wild animals have to be kind of natural statisticians, looking for patterns in the apparent randomness of nature when they're looking for food or trying to avoid predators. There are two kinds of mistakes they can make. They can either fail to detect pattern when there is some, or they can seem to detect pattern when there isn't any, and that's superstition. Sixty years ago, the American psychologist B.F. Skinner investigated the behavior of pigeons, rewarding them with food when they learned to peck a key in the feeding apparatus. But then Skinner set the apparatus to reward the birds at random. Now the pigeons just had to sit back and wait. But that isn't what they did. Instead, the majority developed what Skinner called superstitious behavior. When an individual pigeon, for example, happened to look over its left shoulder, and the reward mechanism just happened to click in at that point, it would have got the idea that it was looking over the left shoulder that had got it the reward, so it tried it again. By sheer luck, as it happened, the reward mechanism delivered food at the same time again. And so the pigeon was reinforced in its idea that looking over the left shoulder was what got it the reward. And it went on and on and turned into a maniac for looking over the left shoulder. Humans can be no better than pigeons. We constantly create false positives. We touch wood for luck, see faces in toasted cheese, fortunes in tea leaves. These provide a comforting illusion of meaning. This is the human condition. We desperately want to feel there's an organizing force at work in our bewilderingly complex world. And in the irrational mindset, if you believe in the mystical pattern you've imposed on reality, you call yourself spiritual. Spirituality is a prized commodity. The media tell us to respect spiritual souls and their apparently deep insights. Spiritual self-help guides do a roaring trade in the material world, outnumbering science books by three to one. But what does spirituality actually mean? So please take your seat and please come slowly and gently uh, so that we can start the proceeding without losing time. So could you please... Um... Satish Kumar is the editor of Resurgence, an ecological magazine at the sandal-wearing end of the Green Movement. And he counts amongst his many fans Prince Charles and the Dalai Lama. I represent the entire history of evolution. I was present in the beginning, the first Big Bang, and I'll be here for billions of years to come. But isn't Satish's spirituality just about imposing yet another superstitious false positive? The world is made of two elements. One element is visible element. The other aspect of creation is invisible dimension, things we cannot see. So, so what is that element which is invisible? I call it spiritual. When you go in a room, you say there is a good feeling here, there is a spirit of ah, the room. Well, now you've changed to something rather different. The, the spirit is a very big and very holistic and very inclusive word. It is not defined in a one particular way. So when you go in a room, you can say, the tree has a spirit. A, a rock has a spirit. 